Good morning and welcome to the Storytelling and Scaling Conservation Success Workshop. My name is Carlisle Howard and I'm the Communications Coordinator for the Changing Landscapes Initiative at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. I really appreciate you all being here. I'm just going to take two minutes to talk about the structure of the workshop and our speakers, but then we can just get started. So I started working in communications for the Changing Landscapes Initiative a few years ago, and that's CLI for short. And often I just wish there were more opportunities to discuss the way that I had been communicating our project to other storytellers and communicators. So I kind of just jumped at this opportunity for communicators to be able to share their practical wisdom with us and then have these kind of one-on-one -on -one sessions where they can talk with you about how you're telling the story of your work. Science and communication arts is such a natural partnership for me, and I hope that this workshop can also be a good opportunity to network and create space for new collaborations. Um, the workshop is gonna be split between these two speakers here, Dr. Gratch and Brooke Telly, and they're gonna be focused on different ends of the storytelling spectrum. So Dr. Gratch is gonna start us off on storytelling theory. So what are stories and how do you build one? And then Brooke Tully is going to talk about application. So how do you use your story to affect change? I'm going to finish out by showing you a case study. So I'll present concrete examples of how our project has seen success in the communications of our science at the local scale. Hopefully you can take some of this and adapt it to your own work. Um, one reminder is we still have open spots for the one-on-one -on -one sessions. In addition to Dr. Grouch and Brooke, we have Amy Enkelmeyer, the Web and Media Content Specialist for the National Zoo, Tim Popa, Communications Director for Nelson Bird Waltz, and Will Stoltzenberg, an independent wildlife journalist. So email me, howardm1 at si.edu, if you want to grab one of those spots. Um, so Dr. Grouch is going to start us off. He is an academic and a storyteller. He is the Assistant Professor of Communications and Media at Utica College in New York and he studies how storytelling takes shape in the digital age. So I'm gonna allow you to share your screen um, and hand it off to you. All right, thank you, uh, Carlisle. And thank you all for coming. I'm very excited to get the chance to talk about storytelling uh, with you all. Um, just a, a warning, there is a four-year-old running around this house. So at any moment, we might be interrupted. Um, Okay, so uh, like uh, Carlisle said, uh, my expertise is in storytelling as an oral traditional form, but given our current age, I do study it in the digital realm as well. And so today what I want to talk about is the goals of uh, storytelling in general, and then what makes storytelling and storytellers engage in a very unique mode of communication and how that can be applied to um, research and to the scientific world as well. So I'll start with a quote from the literary theorist Walter Benjamin, who said that the storyteller takes what he knows from experience and he in turn makes that the experience of his audience. So storytelling is about this sharing experience. A storyteller crafts a narrative for and with an audience. And I use the term craft here as opposed to storytelling being an art because art uh, often leaves people with that feeling like, oh, I'm not an artist. Um, and you know, I, I think that's wrong in and of itself, but the craft um, suggests that anyone can do this. Uh, so for example, if I was making a wooden bowl, I, am, I might not be the best craftsman, but I can make something that is useful um, out of a piece of wood that can be used as a kind of bowl or something along the lines. It might not be as beautiful as someone else's, but it will still work. And that's the goal here, is to create stories that work, that will be useful for our audiences. So I think we can view storytelling in three distinct yet often interrelated ways. First, we can view stories as acts of individual expression, an expression of the experiences of the storyteller themselves. Second, we can view storytelling as a cultural art form. And finally, we can view stories as an institutional tool. And so uh, by way of example, I will tell you a short story and then I'll explain how these three parts uh, work together. So this is a story about two brothers who grew up in a um, powerful family within a large hunter-gatherer community. And the older brother recognized within his community that there was a problem with the leadership. 
Um, it wasn't necessarily bad, but it wasn't as good as it could be. And so he used his cunning and prowess to take over leadership of the community. And during his tenure as leader, the community thrived. They expanded their hunting grounds, social relationships became much more positive, and in general, there was just a feeling amongst the community members that things were good. Unfortunately, after about four years, the older brother fell grievously ill, and the younger brother, who had none of the cunning and prowess that his older brother did, but was incredibly powerful and strong and forceful, the younger brother took over control. And the next four years weren't exactly a reign of terror, but they weren't exactly positive. They maintained their same hunting grounds, but there was a fear that pervaded the community. Um, there was lots of infighting, and so much so that eventually a few members of the community planned a coup and overthrew the younger brother. Now, neither brother ever returned to leadership roles within the community, but the older brother continued to exert his influence by advising other members of the community and led a very positive remainder of his life surrounded by all sorts of friends within the community. The younger brother, however, did not have many friends after his reign and he spent the rest of his life mostly alone and died from sickness at a fairly um, young age. Now, the younger brother was a chimpanzee named Frodo, and the older brother was a chimpanzee named Freud, and both lived at the Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania, where they were named and studied by Jane Goodall. For us today, the stories of Frodo and Freud are not remarkably surprising, but before Jane Goodall stepped into East African jungle to live as a neighbor and to study the chimpanzees community there, the story might have struck us as pure fantasy, something straight out of a morality tale for children. For us, though, we live in a world whose understanding of animal communities has largely been built from the pioneering work of Jane Goodall. So that when we hear the tale of Freud and Frodo, our response is simply, well, there but for the grace of a few genes go I. So I want to talk about this um, in those three sort of goals of storytelling. So first, as a mode of individual expression. Dr. Goodall's life and work shows us the tenacity of a person doing a thing in her way that no one else can do. That's not to say that other people don't engage in similar types of work, it's just that they do it differently. Like we might compare the life and work of Jane Goodall with the life and work of someone like Steve Irwin. Totally different people, yet they both believed in the same thing. Dr. Goodall's story comes specifically from her experience in the same way that Steve Irwin's story would come from his experience as well. So in this way, storytellers convey a very specific experience of the world to an audience. Second, stories serve as a cultural art. Um, and this story, the story of uh, Jane Goodall, is clearly geared towards Western audiences, where in the West, we have traditionally viewed our relationship to animals as us being better than them. So animals are primarily used for food or for tools, and we see them as not um, of the same intellect or intelligence as human beings. Jane Goodall's story helped us see that differently. Now, if you came from a culture where you already acknowledge the complex personhood of animals or that they might have, then the story that Jane Goodall tells, her life's experience, would probably not be as compelling to us. So stories resonate because the audience recognizes within the story a way of understanding the world. And finally, as an institutional tool, we can see her using her story of her work with chimpanzees to create a new mythos and a new understanding of ourselves through how we view animals. So the story she presents requires us to challenge what we knew as a culture, and she has built this to help us establish a new institutional understanding of animals and of our relationship to animal world. Hence, stories can codify standards standards of practice so that we each see ourselves within a story in a particular way. We have now a changed understanding of conservation because of the work of Jane Goodall, along with the work of many others. So hopefully you can see the role that stories play, the ends that they serve. But other forms of communication might get across these ends as well. So what about the nature of story as a distinct communicative tool makes it different from other forms of communication? Well, there's three aspects that go into um, telling a story, the act of telling. Uh, these were defined by Walter Benjamin as the soul, the eye, and the hand. Um, and so I use these terms, and the soul and the eye denote the work of understanding uh, what we do with our soul, 
and seeing human experience, the eye. Uh, the work of the hand is that craftsmanship that I talked about in the beginning. Um, employed as a storyteller fashions, the raw material of experience, the things that we've seen and understood in the world into something that the audience can then understand. And I think as scientists and as researchers, we can all see that we are really great at seeing and understanding um, the world. That's what we do. The difficult part then is crafting that so that our audience will also understand it uh, as well. So once again, uh, let me demonstrate this with a story. Uh, this is called the story about stories. Now, once there was an old woman who was bent over, nearly broken by time, and she wandered into a small village, and she went to the first door that she came across, and she knocked on the door, and the door opened just a creak, and she looked up at the person who answered, and she said, please, uh, I'm tired and hungry. Could you spare some food? And the man looked down at her and he said, I'm sorry, times are tough. We barely have enough food for our own family. And he went to shut the door in her face, but she stopped him. And she said, if you have no food, perhaps a place to spend the night. I have nowhere to sleep. And he said, I'm sorry, we barely have enough room for our own family. And with that, he shut the door on her. So she went to the next house and then the next house and the next house. And at each house in the village, she received the same response. Until finally resigned to her fate, she climbed up a hill found a tree and spread out her things to spend the night under that tree. Now, as she was about to fall asleep, she noticed a stranger coming into the village. And she watched as that stranger went up to that first house that she had tried at, knocked on the door, and no sooner had the door opened than the stranger was welcomed in. It was this thought that haunted her as she tried to sleep through the night. And when she got up in the morning and gathered her meager belongings, she saw the stranger exiting the house. So she rushed down the hill to meet him. And she said, excuse me, I have to know, what is your secret? I tried at every house in the village, but everywhere turned me away. But you, you try one house and immediately you're welcomed in. What's your secret? Now the man looked down at the old woman and he can see that she was tired and that she was lived a hard life. And he said, when the people look at you, they know that they're looking into the future, what will come. And she looked up at the young man and she saw that he was beautiful. And he said, when they look at me, they see what they hope that they can be. The woman said she understood that that was the way of the world. And the man said, but I have an idea. Why don't we travel together? And whenever we come to a new village, you will simply hide within my cloak. And from that way, we will both be gained entrance. And the woman thought this was a great idea. And she said, thank you. What is your name? And he said, my name is Story. And she said, thank you, Story. My name is Truth. So from that day on, wherever they went, Truth could be found hidden within Story's cloak. Now, Story's job isn't to mask the truth, but to comfort us as we prepare to take in the truth. Additionally, stories do what they do. As I said, they serve as modes of expression, of uh, cultural art, and as institutional tools, and they do so in two broad ways. So first, uh, stories give shape to our lives. Often life can seem completely chaotic. Uh, we're in the midst of living and we don't know what's going on. Right now, the COVID-19 pandemic is a perfect example of this. Uh, we're all getting news and information from all sorts of different sources, and it just seems like total chaos. A well-crafted story can help us better see the moment and better understand the moment so that we know what to do within the moment. Secondly, our lives are also shaped by stories. Um, in, in this approach, we can see that we exist within stories. This is what the anthropologist uh, Barbara Meyerhoff termed us as homo narrans. Uh, a, narr a narrative framework is natural to us. Um, whether that's something we learned or that's something we're born into, um, either way, we understand narrative intuitively. And these are two sides to the same coin, right? Life is chaotic and we need to make sense of it so that we craft stories. But at the same time, life has these deep underlying narrative structures, which if we dig deeply enough and approach critically enough, we will probably understand. And the other reason why we tell stories, uh, just so that we don't forget this, is that stories are fun. They're enjoyable. We enjoy listening to stories. Our analytical brains often turn off when we hear a story and we just enjoy the moment. 
So now I want to uh, talk a little bit about the role of the storyteller and why it's important for scientists to take on this role. And again, I will start with a story. This story is called The Storyteller Knows Me. So once there was an ethnographer who wanted to study rural indigenous populations. And she uh, set out and found one of these populations and asked the leaders of the community if she could join them and study them and share with them some of her technology. The leaders didn't think that this would be a problem, and so they welcomed her in. And so when she was introduced to the community, she brought out a tablet, and she gave the tablet to the community and told them how to use it. And she watched with wonder as for the first few days, members of the community used the tablet to uh, learn stories from all over the world, to listen to music, to watch movies and videos, and learn all sorts of wonderful things. But after the first few days, fewer and fewer people were using the tablet. And by the end of the first week, the tablet lay completely untouched. So at a community event, um, at a gathering, the ethnographer asked why people stopped using the tablet. What was wrong with it? And one of the members of the community stood up and she looked at the ethnographer and she said, we already have a storyteller. And the ethnographer was taken aback and she said, well, sure. And I bet your storyteller knows hundreds of stories, but the tablet gives you access to millions of stories. You can hear things from all over. And the community member looked back at the ethnographer with a you know, mixture of humor and pity. And she said, yes, but the storyteller knows me. So the core aspect of storytelling is this sharing of experience between audience and teller. The audience has to be able to see themselves and their life within the story being told. And that only happens if the storyteller sees the audience themselves in the story from the audience's own perspective. Um, so again, as I'm nearing the end of this, uh, I, I just want to say the goal of storytelling is to translate experience. The experience that we learn from viewing the world um, and understanding the world into something that will be useful for our audience, what we might call a practical wisdom. So this isn't about creating a new story out of nothing. Rather, we take what already exists and we shape it for what the situation calls for, taking into account the truth that the audience needs to hear and the vehicle that will deliver that truth, keeping in mind that that vehicle must be rooted in the teller's own experience. So one more story by way of example. Um, Trinh Minh Ha is a Vietnamese filmmaker and literary theorist who grew up during the Vietnam War. So this is a story that she tells. It's a fiction yet deeply rooted in her experience and it contains a truth that I think we can all benefit to hear. So once there was an old woman bent over and nearly broken by time. And the old woman wandered into a village, tired and hungry. And she came to the first house that she saw in the village. She knocked at the door. The door slowly opened and a man looked down at her. And she said, please, I'm hungry and tired. Could you spare some food? And the man said, I'm sorry. We barely have enough food for our own family. And he went to shut the door on her. But she stopped him again and she said, well, if you have no food, perhaps a place to spend the night. And he said, I'm sorry, we barely have enough room for our own family. And with that, he did shut the door on her face. So she went to the next house and the next house and the next house until she was turned away from every house in the village. Resigned to her fate, she climbed a hill, found a tree to spend the night under. And as she was laying out her things, she looked out at the little village nestled in a beautiful, lush, green valley. And she watched as the sun was setting over the horizon the sky awash with reds and golds and purples. And there, watching that view, she said a silent prayer of thanks to the people of the community, for though they could not afford to spare food or comfort for her, they were able to give her this amazing view. So I like this story for two reasons. Uh, first, it's about the reality of hope. Um, hope is not something where we necessarily have hope and yay, everything's going to be fine. Uh, it's a situation where we often recognize that things are not good and things are really hard. But despite that, we find within it something that is useful, something that we could use to move forward. And second, it's about using stories that already exist 
and then shaping them to help us meet our goals. You heard that story before, but the way we hear it now speaks directly to Trinh Minh Ha's personal experience of growing up during the Vietnam War. So I wanna conclude uh, this presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, just with a, a quick slideshow, just to wrap up a couple of uh, my points here. If I can make this work, there we go. All right, so the, the big takeaway from here is I want us to remember that um, the goals of storytelling, uh, the main goal is that it's a shared experience. And there's three interrelated goals. Uh, first, uh, the individual expression. So a teller conveys a specific experience of the world to their audience. Uh, second, as a cultural art, uh, the audience recognizes the worldview of the story, right? The story comes from the culture that the audience understands and is ready to engage in. And third, as an institutional tool, uh, stories can codify standards of practice so that they become more normalized within society. And this is incredibly important, especially if we're thinking through science. And so it's that middle part where these three converge, where we hear some of the greatest stories about sciences and technologies and our advancements. And so if we're thinking about the storyteller, those are those three aspects of the storyteller that I want us to remember. The I, the storyteller seeks to experience the world around them. The soul, the storyteller seeks to understand human experience. And I know as researchers and as academics and as advocates and as environmentalists, we are all doing these things, right? We seek to experience the world and we seek to understand that experience. And finally, what makes us into storytellers is the use of the hand. We shape our understanding of human experience into something that we know our audience will find useful. So I want to thank you all uh, for listening today. I'm excited to uh, soon hear from uh, Brooke and Carlisle as well. Uh, and I'm excited to also talk with some of you after this uh, presentation. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Gratch. Um, so Brooke's up next. Brooke, um, Brooke trains conservationists on how to design outreach plans that motivate action. So she brings together best practices from commercial advertising, insights from behavioral science, and her firsthand experiences in conservation. Um, so Brooke. Great, thank you. Carla, I just want to confirm that my audio is coming through. Yep, it is. Okay. And you can see my screen. Yes, I can. Awesome, great. Well, hello everyone. We have a, an amazing group on here. I do see some names I recognize. So hello to all my friends out there. Um, and thank you, Dr. Gretsch, that was awesome. And you actually, you have a great storytelling voice that I hope in the future we get some podcast or YouTube videos of you telling stories. I'd be totally down for that. So I actually wanna build on one of the stories that Dr. Gretsch told uh, that ended with the storyteller knows Knowing our audience helps us connect with them, helps us relate to them, and ultimately helps us motivate them to do something new or different that we want them to do to help protect the planet and its natural resources. And I just love this line. I think we've actually all felt this at some point in our own lives as well, when we've connected with something and we felt seen. And I really, I wanna talk about this as the first part of my presentation, all about knowing your audience. Knowing our audience, and, and Dr. Gratch talked about this as well, is understanding the world from their perspective, from their point of view, what's going on on their end. And that can come from asking some, honestly, some hard questions of what's important to them? What's going on right now in this moment for them? What do they value and care about the most? Sometimes these things are different than what we value and care about as the storyteller, as scientists, researchers, conservationists, and I'll get into that a bit more later. What problems is our audience trying to solve? And this could be their daily problems or bigger picture problems, things that they're aspiring to, that they want to achieve and, and work towards. What interests them and what excites them? And even if we're thinking about behavior change and motivating action, what are some of the things that might be preventing them from getting there that might make it hard to do that? So it's certainly not easy to answer these questions. It comes from studying and researching our audience as well. 
through a variety of means, whether that's market research, because there's always a ton of data getting collected on consumers and audiences and what's going on in their worldview. Also conducting our own level of research, qualitative in-depth interviews, quantitative research to figure out how prevalent some of these values or interests are among the group that you're looking at. But it also comes down to identifying a specific audience segment that you're communicating with. We tend to default to, we want to talk to everyone or our audience is the general public. But the general public and everyone won't have the same set of values, won't be trying to solve the same problems for themselves, don't have the same interests. So can we carve out a segment of that much larger group around some of these psychographic traits, around some of these existing behaviors so that we can really understand their audience and we can see them? And that'll be equally important on their end to know that they have been seen. So this is on a more segment level. I'm actually, I wanna come up a level on the next slide and talk about some universal human truths. And these are things that across segments, even across geographies and cultures and contexts are some things that every human has a need for and connects with. And I'm gonna start in the middle and talk about these a little bit. This is the hierarchy of needs. Belonging. We have a natural inclination to, and desire to feel a sense of belonging. We want to feel connected to others. We want to be accepted by our peers and accepted by the people that we really admire and look up to. We certainly don't want to feel left out. And that's sort of the opposite of belonging, but it's a huge driver for why we want belonging. This is all about us being a herd species right here. The level above esteem. We all have a desire to feel validated. Validated that our work is, va is valuable, that the things we're doing are worth it, that we're seen, that it's worthwhile, and that we have that sense of achievement for things that we've done. Self-actualization for those who are looking to achieve that, all about being a better version of ourselves for having an impact, fulfilling a purpose, and these are our individual purpose that we have described for ourselves. So you can see in yourselves and the people that you talk to, your audiences, there's likely a lot of these needs going on. I want to belong, I want to feel validated for what I do and what I contribute, and I want to make a difference. Now, depending on the communities that you're working in, the audiences you have, they may be struggling with some of the basic needs, physiological, safety, health, well-being, security, food. And so their, their struggles and their worldview is going to be a bit different. But everyone in the world has these basic needs that we can tap into in a way of understanding our audiences a bit more and think about where are they now and what are some of these problems they're trying to solve? How can I relate to them? How can my story connect to them based on what's going on in their worldview? I want to connect this a bit, and I'll do this a few times throughout my slides, with what's going on with coronavirus and where people are at right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. So interestingly, a lot of our audiences around the world are experiencing some very similar things. And we don't always have this in terms of what's going on in our audience's world right now. The fact that people in multiple countries are having very similar experiences right now. So certainly these will vary depending on particular context and level of intensity of the pandemic in those areas. But most folks are juggling a lot of change. Some of this is getting kind of normalized right now, and even that is a bit strange and change in itself. Folks are at home a lot more than they ever have. They're online a lot more than they ever have. We might have thought before, we can't get more online than we have been, but we are actually online even more now than ever before. Everyone's coping with a level of fear and anxiety and uncertainty. And this can be just about the health in itself, but it's also about job stability, uh, income security, retirement security, how my family's doing, and when is this all gonna end? So all these question marks and uncertainties. So when I talk about the hierarchy of needs, even those of us that may have been previously looking at achieving self-actualization, we've all come down a few notches and said, well, I'm just concerned about my own safety and security and about where these things are going. So recognizing that this is a shift in the problems we're trying to solve and what's going on in our worldview. 
As a result, many of us are seeking distractions, positivity, things to do, and connection, any kind of connection that we can get since we're all very much self-isolated. And this just gives a snapshot of understanding our audiences and how we can understand what's going on on their end so that we can craft a story that connects with that. And we want to do that because knowing what's important to our audience helps us relate to them. And any good storyteller, every great storyteller and marketer and communicator is one that connects and relates to their audience. And you may have places that you buy from as a consumer that you feel they really get me. I feel a connection to them. And it might be Patagonia, and that's totally fine, but you're like, Patagonia gets me. They get my lifestyle, they get the things I value, they demonstrate similar values that I have, and I feel seen. And that comes from knowing our audiences and knowing how to relate to them. And this means, and this is, I, I love the, the part about, in Dr. Gratch's presentation about craftsmanship and crafting our story. So we have a lot of things we want to say to our audiences, things we truly want them to feel. This is, I'm just, you know, a few examples here. This is important. We must act now. We're going to lose these species. The sea levels are rising. We can't keep doing business as usual. These are things that we desire as the communicator, as the storyteller. Yet our audiences have a whole different set of values, concerns, and interests. What's best for me and my family? What's something fun to do? How can I make things easier for us? What are even other people doing about this issue? And the craftsmanship comes in taking the things we want to say and connecting it to the things that our audience are interested in. And when we don't do that, and to be totally honest, we don't have a great history of doing that in the environmental and conservation field. When we don't do that, we end up talking past our audience. So it just goes right past them, doesn't connect with them, doesn't reach them. Not that they don't hear the message, but it's just not making that bond. It's not creating that relevance that we need. And also, as said before, this is not about making a story out of nothing, kind of manufacturing a story. It's about crafting and repositioning the things we want to say in a way that connects to what's important to our audience. And there's a variety of different ways of doing that. And I want to give just one example here for now is public health. This is coming up a lot with coronavirus as well. Public health can be a very powerful frame, message frame to use that helps us craft our story in a way that connects to our audience. This was a study that looked at different message frames around climate change. One around, it's an issue of national security, it's an issue of the environment, it's an issue of health, personal health and public health. And they found that the frame around public health actually connected with folks who typically would be seen as cautious, disengaged, even dismissive of climate change. And it's just a different lens, crafting that story in a different way that connects to our audience on things that are really important with them, creates greater interest and even greater optimism for change. It's that powerful, our ability to craft these things in a slightly different way. I also want to point out here in the slide while I have the opportunity to, when we talk about, when I mentioned earlier about audience segments and being able to segment them in a smaller way, this is a really interesting approach for that. So they've segmented audiences based on their connection and engagement and really reaction with climate change. You have a cautious group, a disengaged group, a dismissive group, right? These aren't demographics. These are perspective-based. They're psychographics. And it just gives a really good example of how we can come down from that, that general public or everyone group to something a bit more concrete. Coming back to where we are now with coronavirus and how we can make some of our conservation and environmental re messages relevant right now, that really comes down to being helpful, right? People are juggling a lot, of, a lot of changes. They're seeking things to do. There's a lot of newness and there's a lot of resources needed. We, we want to have things that we can work on while we're at home and we're a bit antsy, we're getting even antsier. So how can we reposition the things that we want people to do, or the stories we want to tell, so they're relevant to what's going on in people's world right now? Some ideas for that, share activities to do, be 
recycling activities, nature activities, backyard nature stuff is really cool, gardening activities, things they can do at home, either as families or individually. We can work on improving some behaviors during this time, mainly around food and energy use. Folks are spending more time with they, their food, they wanna go shopping less, they want their food to go further, and they're home a lot more. So they actually have a little bit more time with food than they normally would. Can we talk about reducing food waste? Not necessarily as an environmental benefit, but one that helps them keep their food going further for them and lasting longer for the benefit of them and their family. Tips for keeping energy consumption low. Ideas for recycling and composting. Reduce, reuse, all of this stuff. This is a great opportunity to bring some of these messages now because they're gonna be more relevant than even they were before. And lastly, provide an escape. There's an opportunity here to further form and even strengthen those bonds we have with nature and the environment and species by bringing all that beauty to folks in their homes. And this really can create that affinity that even when this is all over and done, we have a greater appreciation that we can leverage to hopefully push those advocacy levers, push those uh, preservation protection levers after this appreciation has been further bonded. Engaging in, uh, images of animals, VR, virtual tours of amazing places, nature sounds that relax us, even downloadable Zoom backgrounds we can have fun with. Uh, and this example here on the bottom right is from the Shedd Aquarium that did a video of their penguins enjoying the aquarium. And it just gives us such a sense of optimism and hope and fun that it further connects us with the things that we're often trying to get people to pay attention to, which is nature and the planet. Now, there are some message frames that we tend to use fairly regularly. These are sort of our default message frames, and they, they just don't work hard enough for us. It can work in some situations with some audiences, but technically, or not technically, but typically they don't form a strong enough connection to spark engagement and action. And these are messages of doom and gloom, even scare or shock tactics, uh, you know, just throwing facts at people, ending with knowledge and awareness and not furthering the engagement past that, and even messages of loss. Of if we don't act now, we're gonna lose all of this. So if you think that your audience might be receptive to these messages, cool. I suggest testing them out, doing some pre-testing with that. But recognize that we, there are so many other more motivational frames we can use that will connect with our audience a lot more than these. These tend to actually turn people off. They either ignore them or they're sort of turned off by them and then they just ignore it and move on. So the last thing I wanna talk about today are stories that motivate action. And how can we craft stories that not only engage interest, but move people to do something? And we have an amazing history of telling actually amazing nature stories. We do that really, really well. Our, our documentary, our David Attenboroughs, our Jane Goodalls, they're just so great at doing this. And this is actually an, an interesting study that shows that the, you know, the series specifically that was done on planet Earth too, raises interest and engagement through the storytelling on all the different species they feature in those episodes. Even some that might be considered less charismatic species, the spike in Wikipedia and Google searches and Twitter trends during those episodes came up just, and that's actually the dark red line is when that species was mentioned in the episode and the spike of searches and online trends for that species. And that is awesome. The fact that we are engaging people in these documentaries and they may not even be our typical conservationists and they're spending the energy, and it's like low energy, but doing a Google search, doing a Wikipedia search, you know, putting it on Twitter is great. We want that level of engagement. The same study showed that that engagement didn't convert into action. And in particular here, they were looking to secure donations. They were hoping to secure donations. Didn't convert into that action. And we can do more to take this interest, take this engagement that we're working towards and make it into something more actionable. And a few tips on how we can do that. One, well, we, we gotta let them know what we want them to do. And that's the first part. They need to be clear on what they can do once they're interested, once they're engaged. Do, you, do they need to recycle? Should they make a promise to blow bubbles instead of using balloons at their next event? 
what do we need them to do now that we have their attention, now that they're engaged, now that they're with us, connected in that moment? And be clear on that. If we're not clear on it, then there's no way that our receiver is going to know what to do on their own. We love information. How can we make it buzzworthy? And there's a formula from this, from the book Changeology. You can provide surprising and new information, to give folks a sense of wow, of wow and awe, plus an optimism for change. An example on the left, this is how many paper cups get used in 10 minutes. That's information, it's sort of a wow factor, like look at that, and then this is what you can do to recycle and refuse the cup next time. And I highlight this because this is also a story being tell, told in an instant. We won't always get a long time to tell our story, so how do we tell it in a snapshot or in a graphic, like the flatten the curve graphic that I'm sure everyone's familiar with? How do we take a concept and make it so interesting, so palatable, and so shareworthy that people connect with it? And so that's part of the buzzworthy factor. Can we demonstrate the desired behavior by showing and telling what others are doing? Doing this in our story, doing it through visuals, and using relatable messengers. Uh, and Dr. Gratch gave the example of Steve Irwin and Jane Goodall. These are amazing messengers. We may not be the best messenger. Is there someone else there? Someone that's very similar to the audience or someone the audience admires and respects? Doesn't have to be a celebrity personality. Just someone that can connect with that audience maybe better than we can. And can we have some fun with it? Things like Save the Planet Beyonce lives on. The hand washing, this is a website, wash your lyrics. Choose your own song. It doesn't have to be happy birthday to yourself twice. What's a song that you want to sing and spend the 20 seconds washing your hands to? And protecting the crab cake population instead of protecting the crab. These are all fun ways of talking about a desired behavior, about connecting with our audience. They also tap into things that are personally meaningful to, for our audience. And these may not be the things that we typically think of. They may not be totally planet related, like crab cakes, Beyonce, and music, but it connects with our audience on their terms. And some closing tips on crafting stories that motivate action. Tailor your story for each audience segment. You can have a core story for sure, and how do you tailor that depending on who you're talking to, depending on what you're asking them to do in that moment? And similarly, can you tailor your story for the medium? Sometimes you will get to tell the full story. But what does the social media version of that look like? What does the elevator pitch of that version look like? What's the visual version of your story? And think about how it might need to get tailored depending on the amount of time you have and the medium for your story. Tell more human stories. Humans love to see themselves in the story. We need to mirror other humans doing that behavior so we understand what it looks like and what it can feel like. We tend to lean on telling animal stories. We don't have to move entirely away from that, but how can we tell human stories? Plus ones that empower and inspire our audience. It really helps them aspire to be the better version of themselves and believe that change is possible. Not that it's all doom and gloom and you know, going to hell in a handbasket, but we can do something and I individually can do something that leads, out, uh, leads into greater and bigger impact and change. And that is it for me. Thank you, Carla. I'm looking forward to having the one-on-one -on -one discussions a little bit later and getting into more and more of the nitty and gritty of this. Thank you so much, Brooke. And thank you, Dr. Gatch. I was really captivated during both of those. So thank you. It was so great to see those. Um, I'm going to end my case study with a few logistics um, and a Q&A session. Just as a reminder, let me share my screen. Just as a reminder, we have those one-on-one -on -one session spots still open. So email me at howardm1 at si.edu um, with, you know, I want a one-on-one -on -one session and a short, really short description of your project. Um, Brooke, can you hear me? Is my audio good? Okay, cool. So I'm going to jump into this case study. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm Carlisle and I do communications for the Changing Landscapes Initiative or CLI at the Smithsonian. And before I get into it, I just need to give a little bit of context into what it is that we do. 
Um, so we're a team at the Smithsonian and we're working to understand the impacts of land use change in a place that is rapidly changing. So that's our study area, the Shenandoah region highlighted in light blue. So this is a place that is rich with biodiversity, productive farmland, and as you can see, there's lots of development fast approaching from DC, and that's that red, uh, the red star there. So that's all that light pollution, all that development that's just spreading into our region. The thing is, is that most land use decisions here are made without any idea of how they're going to impact the area's natural resources in the long term. And so that's why it's so important that we bridge the gap between scientists and communities, local communities here and everywhere. So we work closely with local communities to produce science that is relevant to the decisions that people are making right now about the land. So we're communicating to local communities here that our land is changing and why we think it's happening and how it could impact our natural resources. So it was only once we actually gained steam with the local community that we were able to start providing our science to the people actually planning on the ground, to the people who would actually use it. So given all this and given the success that we've had communicating our science to local communities, I think I have a lot to share um, about how to, how to get to know local audiences and then, and then what has really hit the mark with us. And hopefully you can take some of that and adapt it to your own work. So I mentioned this because I think this is a really common trap that we tend to fall into when we talk about what, talk about the science that we do, which is, this is exactly what I do, this is how I do it, and this is what my results have been. But in reality, our goal is to capture people's attention, keep them entertained, make them feel something, and in doing so, shifting their perspective. And the only way to do that is to actually know your audience. And when you're working with local communities, you can have a really good opportunity to actually know your audience. Um, so a really good way to do this is in a casual setting. So for example, I went out to local town halls and community leadership meetings and just figured out who are those influential people? Who, who's the person that people are really listening to in their community? And I just asked them out to coffee. Um, so this is an example I went out, well, a woman had me over for coffee. Um, she's one of those you know, influential people in her community. She showed me the family graveyard in the front yard and she read me excerpts from the diary of a girl who lived in her house during the Civil War. So not only did I get to know her a lot better, but I also started to see the lens through which people here understand the land, which is through a lens of history and through a lens of agriculture. So I realized at the point that if I wasn't acknowledging agriculture and history in my presentations, then I, I was risking just not being relevant and not connecting with my audiences. Another really good way to do this is to put together an advisory board of conservation and community leaders. So we have an advisory board and we run all of our messaging, all of our presentations by them, kind of like a test group before we take it public. Another thing is to use like we, our, us language in your presentation. So you wanna be seen as just as much of a part of community as them. Um, so you wanna use words like, you know, how do we plan for a future we wanna live in? And how do we avoid these effects on, their, on our home? Like I use these slides in our presentations when I go out into the community. The next is to give yourself a story. So, make yourself seem human um, and give people a story that they can really connect and relate to and so that they can relate to your issue too. Um, so I always start off with a story about why I'm so invested in what I'm talking about. So I show pictures of my hometown, um, McLean, Virginia, and some of you may know it as Tyson's Corner, um, and it's right, right outside of DC. So these are pictures um, in the 1950s and the 1970s. And those images look so much like so much of our region, of our study region. Um, and then these are those two same exact locations today. So McLean is not really a walkable place. It's not livable. It's not affordable. It's really expensive. And it's not aesthetically pleasing either. And then this was the devastating flooding that my neighborhood suffered from just last summer. Um, so this is what happens when you combine bad land use planning 
with a changing climate and a changing environment. Um, and we're starting to see the de devastating impacts of bad land use planning in places that didn't necessarily have a long-term plan, and didn't necessarily strategically plan for change. So I talk to our audience and I say, you know, we have the opportunity now to figure out what is it about our home that we love so much? And how do we use science to ensure that we can preserve the things we love about our home in the face of change that we know is coming, change that we, that we have mapped and can see that is coming. So that leads me to my last point, which is connect to people's sense of home and nostalgia. Um, so there are so many different kinds of storytelling tools and visuals that you can use. So local news headlines, images, personal stories, videos, art, um, all of these tools are gonna serve kind of different audiences and different purposes, but just as an example, I took images of bumper stickers I see around the community. Um, so I know that this is something they care about. Um, so when I talk about the agricultural land that CLI projects could be lost, I pull up these images and I talk about how this is something we all as a community care about. Associating an emotion to each piece of information or each piece of science that you're giving to people, you're creating cognition. You're making your science easier to remember and easier to absorb. So weaving in any imagery that you can to help people connect their sense of home to the science that you're presenting is going to make a difference. And that leads me to this kind of last storytelling tool that has been probably the most effective for our communications, which has been a result of a collaboration between ourselves and the graphic designers and communicators at Nelson Bird Waltz, one of which is one of our one-on-one -on -one session leaders today, Tim Popa. So CLI has developed a model that projects what the future of our landscape could look like in 40 years. Um, and th these projections show a massive amount of change. But this model takes the form of a map. And maps are tough. Maps are tough to communicate because maps are not emotional. But the thing is, is that pictures of where you grew up are emotional. So we wanted to figure out how do we connect maps and projections of the future to A, make the future feel real, and B, to connect it to people's sense of home, really to connect it to their identity. So we looked at this map and we looked at where in our region is the most change projected. And then we cross-checked it with, okay, where is the most opportunity for people to affect change at the ground level, at the grassroots level? And for us, in our world, that means where is there a comprehensive plan for renewal? So we talked to, well, those two aligned in this county called Rockingham County, home of Harrisonburg, James Madison University. So we talked to conservation groups there and we chose a view, um, they helped us choose a view that they thought would resonate most with people's sense of home, which is this view looking off of Massanut Mountain into the Shenandoah Valley. So what the designers did is they edited this view, edited this, this view of people's home according to what the model depicts. So this is the view now, if you're looking out into the horizon, you can see the view of the Shenandoah Valley. And then when I click the screen, you can see what the model projects if we, if we keep what we're doing what we're doing, if we keep planning the way that we're planning. But if you keep looking out at that view, there's another entirely possible option according to the model with the same rate of population growth, that this is what it could look like if we change for the better and we can change for the better. So us and, and the conservation groups, we take this out to communities and we say, we don't focus on the bad example. We say, this is, this is an option, but we're at a fork in the road. And there are actionable things we can do right now that can take us towards a future that we do want. And that is entirely possible. So my point is that a powerful visual at the right time and at the right place, connected with the right people can affect change. So that's what I have for you on my presentation. Um, if you want to connect with us or just talk about, talk to us about the communications we're doing, there's my email there, howardm1 at si.edu. Um, we're about to hop into a quick Q&A session. We're probably going to run a little bit over, but for whoever wants to stay for the Q&A, you're totally welcome. Just some instruction first on the one-on-one -on -one sessions. 
So in the Zoom reminder email sent to you about an hour before this webinar, um, there's a link to download a PDF of our storytelling activity. So you have to scroll down just a bit, but there's a description below that link of the activity and how to use it. So if you have a one-on-one -on -one session, please work on that worksheet within the time before your session and bring what you have to discuss it with your communicator or storyteller. Uh, email me by 11, 10 a.m. That's the cutoff. If you want one of these one-on-one -on -one sessions and then email me with a short description of whatever it is you want to communicate or whatever it is you're interested in communicating so I can set you up with a communicator that has expertise in that field. Um, I had a few questions that were about a recorded version. The recorded version of the webinar will be on the Earth Optimism website. Um, otherwise, I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to open it up to any questions you have and please feel free to direct it towards a specific person. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to moderate the Q&A. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Open up the questions. Okay. Panelists, are you able to see the questions? Okay. I think we'll give the first question to Brooke from Christine Jacobs. Yes, first question is a hard question. I do appreciate it. Um, so this is, uh, this question comes from Christine. Carlos, should I press the answer live button? Uh, so the question is, while we know that doom and gloom does not motivate, but it does seem that fear does motivate in some cases, especially for health action like with COVID. How should we think about the role of fear in environmental messaging? My short answer for that, and I'll expand on this a bit, is I would think about it very cautiously and very carefully in environmental messaging. Uh, one of the reasons why we are seeing action and motivation with coronavirus is it's very personal. Uh, is something, it is a concern, but it's a personal concern, something that might affect me, might affect my family. And there are things I can do to prevent that from happening. And that feels like, because we see people taking action, that it's, some, it's a lever that we can use. And it may be a lever that we can use. I really question whether or not it's one that we should use. It's not really a good look, and I'm gonna speak a little bit from an advertising background, for our brand of conservation and environmentalism to be one that instills fear in people in order to motivate action. It also is a short term motivator. It might motivate people right now, but it has a, a shelf life. And there are other motivators that last a lot longer that we can continue to use and build upon that gets into a more sustained behavior place. Ideally, where it becomes a social norm and it sort of is, is sticky and folks are doing it as a habit. Once we start with fear, where do we go from there? How do we build upon that? You know, it's just, it's just an escalating of fear at that point. And I really think if we talk about aspiration, motivations, optimism of what can happen and continue to build that, we have a much longer shelf life and lifespan of seeing people move in that direction. Uh, Dr. Gretsch, you want to add to that? Yeah, um, if I could, uh, I agree with everything that uh, Brooke is saying. And I think one aspect of storytelling is that if you're telling a really compelling story, um, we all, and it fits that specific audience, that audience is then going to take that and tell it again, right? Um, and if they tell it again, then someone else is gonna tell it again and again. And so if we start out with a story of fear or doom and gloom, and it's a good story, right? It's compelling other people are gonna tell it and they're gonna spread it, right? And so like, if we find the more positive, hopeful message within a story and can lead with that, then we're more likely to see that become the contagion that catches on. And I'll add to that last point, don't let Twitter fool you. Like Twitter is not the real world. And I know there's a lot of you know, hate and anger and negativity that gets spread there but that's not typically what we see in human to human uh, interactions, interpersonal communication. Those are the things we don't love to share with one another. With that love, that belonging, that esteem, we like to share more positive things with one another in a real world setting. And we can provide those stories for people to share and feel good about sharing. Next question is, does any of this change when thinking about stories, calls to action for children? 
Um, Dr. Gratch, what do you think? You're on mute. <laughs> I think uh, most of it holds for when we're also uh, speaking to children and telling stories geared towards children. Uh, they are a different audience demographic. They have different desires, wants, and needs. Um, and so we have to understand them on their level. And I think the mistake that we often make is to think that uh, we have to dumb things down for children. And I think it's uh, quite the opposite, is we simply have to reframe it so that children uh, understand it from their own experiences of the world. Um, just uh, physically thinking, they see things at a different level uh, than we do, we do. I imagine that they also see things from a different ideological perspective than we do as well. Um, and so it's understanding child development, understanding uh, what types of action children can engage in um, and are willing to engage in and speaking to them from that perspective. Okay. What would be the first step in segmenting your market? Brooke, I think so. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, actually taught a segment about this uh, just yesterday. And I'll do a, a quick plug. I'm doing a trading webinar next Wednesday at 8 a.m. where I talk a bit about segmenting your audience. Um, I, I tend to start with, there's a variety of different ways of doing this, but I start, you know, in, in a brief high level answer of, identifying first what it is we need people to do, what we're asking them to do, or who we need to communicate with, and then saying, what do I know? You know, we're gonna start with everyone, but if I really am looking to affect change, what is that change I'm looking to create? And who are those folks who are engaged with that action, that behavior? I'm speaking very specifically really from a behavior change, um, action change perspective. General storytelling may be different than this response. So uh, Ari, you may want to add to this as well, where I say, okay, if I'm looking to a change behavior or affect change, who's involved in this behavior? And who do I need to reach first to move that change forward? And that can either be those that absolutely need to change because they're doing the most infractions or it's folks who are most receptive and most likely to take that next step. And I can reach them and engage that audience and move into it. So I start there at the basic level and then dig into more and more of the psychographics of who that audience is and are there actually sub-segments there on a psychographic level. And that comes from doing a lot of research. Um, and I think I'll just add one thing, uh, just uh, bouncing off like the research idea is that we all know that when we conduct research, we find things that were unexpected, not all the times, but um, occasionally. And so when we're thinking about our audience and thinking about you know, how we uh, address our audience, uh, we have to allow ourselves to be open to the possibility that we're wrong um, or that at least we're not 100% right, that our audience might bring to us a new perspective that we hadn't quite considered yet. Um, and so if we really are going to understand our audience, that means we also have to challenge what we know and what we believe to be true. Awesome. We're getting a lot of questions in here. Um, there's one from Tim Popa, one of our session leaders. If fear is not effective, what about the idea of a higher purpose and generation change or connecting to a timeline that is multi-generational? Um, yeah, Dr. Raj. Um, yeah, this, uh, this question reminds me of this great project that a storyteller named Corinne Stavish in Detroit um, put together um, probably about 15 years ago now. Uh, and what she did was um, she brought together a number of Detroit-based Holocaust survivors uh, with a bunch of uh, Jewish youth uh, in the Detroit area. Um, and many of the Jewish youth were not connected to uh, their Jewish community. And so this was a way to begin to build generational connections with them. And they worked together for, I believe it was an eight month project uh, where the young people working with the Holocaust survivors traded rituals, um, traded stories, um, and then shaped all of those rituals and stories into a multi-generational performance that helped us better understand what connections um, the youth today have to those who experienced life 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, and so 
the, the hard thing about this is that I, I think the eight months of the project was a reasonable timeline. Um, we can't look at things, uh, if, we, if we really want to create those conversations and create um, talks amongst different generations and different ideologies, it's not going to be something that happens overnight. It's not going to be in a tweet or in a Facebook rant or in a Facebook argument. Uh, it's going to be something that happens where we get together in whatever ways we can and we spend some quality time with each other, which is not exactly A, easy to organize or B, easy to organize. Uh, engage in as well. So um, in terms of thinking through a higher power, again, that's audience specific. And how do we speak to what that higher power might be or uh, how we want to frame it is going to depend on our audience. So short answer, yes, but it takes a lot of time. See, so we have a question from Emma Gregory. What are techniques that you use for building trust within the target audience in order to get to know them? How do you overcome historical mistrust to create effective communication stories? Yeah, I can, co and actually this builds right, up, uh, right on the point that uh, Dr. Grass was just making in terms of the amount of time and investment of getting to know a community. So there is sort of a first pass of, you need to recognize that building trust is a process. And it's one that doesn't happen overnight. And sometimes our program timelines are like, we're gonna come in and start this project right away, but there actually may need to be, you know, three to six months or more before that of just being able to engage with the local community, especially if you're not from that area and building that trust before that work can start. And I, I do have some materials on my site as well in terms of, overcoming conflict. So we sometimes see this conflict because there's sort of an us versus them distrust that's naturally there. You know, you have the enviros coming in, you know, the, the Green Corps coming in, they want us to change, they're gonna tell us what to do. Certainly that comes from, can we approach it a bit more of, from a learning discovery perspective of, we wanna hear from you, we wanna hear your story, what's going on in your end, what is your worldview, and being in a listening mode before we come in in a telling mode. And that some of that can really help overcome maybe uh, conflicts they've had with other groups in the past who haven't taken those steps. I think really demonstrating that you're there to learn and to listen and to support and to help is a, is a big piece of that. And you may also need to find some of those local relatable messengers that can speak, can vouch for you and maybe even speak on your behalf to break down some of the us versus them barriers that may be there. Yeah, and I would, I would talk about a time where it was one of our first presentations um, and it was, it was a pretty big group. And there's a lot of historical mistrust for government entities, I would say, around Northwestern Virginia in our area. And, and we were getting some tough questions afterwards. Um, and at that point, actually someone that I'd gotten to know, someone in the community I'd gotten to know a couple months earlier stood up and kind of started, started asking really good questions and, and really productive questions because he knew me and he knew the work we were trying to do and he knew my intentions. So I think that's why it's so important to get to know the people um, in your community on a personal level and not, maybe not everyone's gonna be open to it, but there are going to be people that are and they're gonna have influence too. So I think we're going to ask one more question um, and then I'm, I want to give you guys some time to just relax and have lunch before your one-on-one -on -one sessions. Since there are so many more questions, and I think they're important ones to answer, um, any question that wasn't answered during this Q&A, um, I think I'll, I'll compile them and I'll get answers for you. And then I'll send them out in the Zoom, like the follow-up email. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, I took screenshots of them. So... There's so many really good questions, honestly, but I'll just go chronologically. So Stephanie Wodzowski asks, wondering what your opinions are about collective storytelling. How do your strategies shift when your audience is involved in the storytelling process? I'm doing an internship with the National Park and through an interpretation lens, we're trying to make programs interactive and have people share their perspectives. So I don't know. I guess I can start with this. Um, in the, 
Part of my answer is going to just depend on what type of relationship you have uh, with your audience. Um, and so an example of something that um, if you can get your audience in a room with you, uh, one thing that's really uh, in, enjoyable to do are different types of story circles. Um, and so these work incredibly well if people have a little bit of time to prepare. So if they're going to come to an event and they know that um, we're going to tell stories at the event, you give them a um, subject with which they can tell the story about. Um, and there's a, a number of ways to do that. One way is to just go around and hear everyone's story. So we know everyone has a moment to uh, listen and tell. Uh, another way to do it is um, there's a, a practice of with everyone together, one person goes into like a middle of a circle and tells a story and they start. And as soon as that story resonates with someone else, that person then goes into the middle of the circle and takes over the telling and they tell their own story. And this goes back and forth. And you end such a session where we talk about what were the stories that we didn't hear enough of and we want to hear more. Um, and that way we get people actively listening to each other and their other stories and then figure out ways to shape those together to help us better tell our own stories because then we know what the audience is at what the stories that the audience actually wants to tell are and then we might be able to tell stories that are similar i'm just going to add a few points to that um, co-creation is certainly also a way of building trust with the community where you're getting their inputs as well, as opposed to just coming in with your own perspective. It can also be a great qualitative research tool. There's some programs called like Photo Voice, where uh, you either give your community members a camera or they have their cameras and you ask them to take photos of things in their daily life, like a day in the life, and then they tell you what those, those photos are saying. So you're really hearing from their perspective what their worldview is like. So it can be a really powerful tool to do it with your audience, either to get to that story or to learn a lot about your audience in the process. Okay. So we're gonna wrap up. Um, again, we're gonna answer any on left um, question, any left questions unanswered, <laughs> any questions left unanswered, and we're gonna send in the follow-up Zoom email. Um, thank you, Brooke and Dr. Gosh, so much. This was really awesome. Um, and I really hope the one-on-one -on -one sessions go well. Um, you know, and I hope we can do a lot more collaborations like this. So thank you to everyone attending and for staying on. And thank you, Carlisle. You really, you really pulled all this together. You made the <laughs> magic happen. Yes, thank you, Carlisle. This was great. We really yeah. appreciated bringing part of it. Well, thanks guys so much. Okay, bye. <laughs>